Um, thanks everybody for joining us today and taking time out of your schedule um, for either a lunch and learn or a breakfast um, and learn on your end. Uh, this is Betsy Scott. I'm the Executive Director of Programming and Engagement for the Alliance. Um, wanted to give you a little overview before we head into the meat of today's discussion on kind of why we're here um, and why we're talking about this subject matter. So today we're focusing on the attainability of the short game, looking at production, productivity, and profit with Scott Saddam of True North uh, Development. Thanks for joining us today, Scott. Thanks for joining us today, Scott. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, well. Oh, you got me now? Uh, we do? Okay, great. Okay, um, oh, that's so, great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the reason why we're talking about the subject matter today is as the Alliance, we have a vision for attainable housing for all. Um, I've seen a lot of times looking at the, you know, searching for the term attainability and usually it results in affordable housing for lower income and at risk populations. But we've found that um, attainability is really rising as an issue for um, households in the U.S. overall. Uh, there, I think the recent stats are that 40% of U.S. households are paying more than 30% of their monthly income for housing. And that's considered to be unattainable, unaffordable, um, and it's something as an industry that we really need to be looking at um, and kind of driving innovation in this area. Um, within our vision, we think we need to collaborate more as an industry in order to thrive. Uh, we don't want to sacrifice quality or value in the housing for attainability. Uh, but in the end, the business models that we follow as an industry need to be sustainable for builders and developers and their partners, as well as attainable for consumers. And in order to get there, uh, we've created a community of change makers in the industry, really from dirt to dweller, uh, focusing on all aspects of housing uh, from a production, building, and development perspective. And we think that by doing so, we're allowed to pull together the collective intelligence of the group and tackle bigger issues like attainability. So um, this uh, webinar that we're doing today is really a lead into a live event that we have next month in Denver and a roadmap that we're currently developing to try and tackle this issue. We'd see it really falling into three big buckets that we need to look at as an industry. The first is place, and that's really you know regulations, uh, land, zoning, NIMBYism, et cetera. Product, and that's both the building itself, the value it provides to the consumer, as well as the business models. What are those financial models that allow um, housing to be more attainable? And last but not least, production, and that's really the focus of, of why we're on the phone today with Scott. Um, and that's looking at making your processes better, streamlining what you're doing so you can cut waste and cost out of your business and ultimately be able to um, add that to your bottom line and share some of those savings with the end consumer. So um, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all of our partners for contributing to um, the Alliance on an annual basis. So you can just see those companies there. So if you're on the phone, and your partner, thank you so much for your support. We really do appreciate it. And um, we are very grateful to have Scott here today as our key presenter. Um, I think most of you know who he is, <laughs> who are on the phone. It kind of goes without saying, but just in short, you know, Scott is certainly an expert in looking at um, lean building and driving waste out of your business as a builder. He's done a lot of analytics to look at and has created some calculators to look at how you can do things more efficiently both in the field and out of the field. Um, so he's going to be sharing some of those insights with us today. So um, in a moment, I'm going to turn the, um, the queue over to him. Uh, but while you're on the phone, we want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, we'd rather not uh, have you raise your hands today, but you do have the ability to type in any questions that you have. Um, in the Q&A uh, tool within Zoom. 
And then you'll also see um, that at the end we'll have um, this little slide with hands raised um, so that you can plug additional questions in toward the end of the call as well. Uh, but we'll probably be conversational with Scott, so if something comes up um, and you ask us something as we're going through and it's timely, we may just uh, pose that question uh, when you send it to us. So feel free to type whenever the mood strikes you. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Scott. Uh, hello from sunny South Lyon, Michigan. It's a, a beautiful fall day, chilly, and I think the frost finally gets on the pumpkin tonight. So a lot of you in other places uh, have different situations, but we don't mind that here. Um, here to talk about attainability, the short game. Um, and this is brings together, as I was putting these slides together, uh, I wanted to make it a, a two hour presentation, then a half day, then a full day, and then a three day, then maybe a week long, because it pulls together so much of what I've been doing and writing about for the past uh, uh, really 32 years in the industry. So uh, there we go, just make sure that's working too. So the facts of home building life these days, uh, uh, don't know who your favorite is, John Burns, Ivy Zellman, uh, uh, Tim Sullivan, any of those folks out there in Metro study, uh, they all tell us the same thing, which is we are overpriced in every segment. And I've got my little broken piggyback picture there. Uh, from the lowest entry level up to the uh, most expensive, uh, multi-million dollar homes like my uh, sister builds in Texas, we are just overpriced everywhere. And there's all sorts of good reasons and uh, good excuses, if you want to call them that, and explanations, uh, but it's not helping our home buyers. Uh, the facts are that, and you can find a different article, multiple articles every day out there, uh, the demand is 1.5 million, maybe 1.6 million, uh, the, the best analysts say. Uh, we're delivering around 1 million. Uh, so really a remarkable gap there. So there's no question that the demand is there. We just can't meet it at the price points needed. Uh, another thing you find an article, column, on blog post about each day is that the answer is offsite. And you know, my background, I go back, uh, did a lot of construction work, uh, worked in, in Lumberyard out through college and I did US Steel in production, I did Motorola in production jobs. Uh, I love manufacturing, I love the plant environment. It's very uh, second nature to me. Uh, I believe in the offsite production, but I'll tell you what Bill Pulte said in a workshop just about, uh, eh, let's see, be about 31 years ago, almost 32 years ago. He said in a workshop uh, with uh, a whole bunch of uh, production and uh, purchasing people. He held up his fingers and he put his thumb and forefinger uh, about an inch apart. And he said, he went through a whole sequence. He said, you know, 30 years ago when he started, and remember I'm talking 30 years ago now, uh, he'd say, we're, we're about this far from having a true application of manufacturing techniques in the home building industry that will revolutionize things. And then he'd say, and about 20 years ago, we were this far, and he'd narrow his fingers down to three quarter. And 10 years ago, he'd make it a half. And five years ago, he'd make it a quarter. And he'd say, today, and he'd make it about an eighth of an inch gap with this far from offsite solutions revolutionizing home building. That was 31, 32 years ago. Uh, I asked Bill, uh, who passed away about a year ago, but I asked him about two years ago, how far we are, and he held up his fingers about a 16th inch apart. And that's where we are still. Um, we're, truth is, we're about round four of this uh, miraculous solutions in, in my career. Uh, it will happen, it must happen, and it has to happen. It will be a big factor in helping us with the labor shortage. Uh, but right now, there's no more than about 1% penetration if you, uh, if you count beyond uh, trusses and wall panels. Those are off-site, but those have been around for uh, 50, 60 years or more. But beyond that, we're no more than about 1% today. So while we're all waiting for our deliverance with these, and again, I'm, I'm a, a believer, I'm a fan, uh, but in the meantime, what is it 
we're going to do. So that's what's important that we talk about today. Okay, so the short game. Uh, a downturn of some degree is coming. And Zillow does this annual survey. I don't know how many of you saw it, but uh, they ask 100 home building industry authority us there, but they didn't ask me. I don't know, Betsy, did they ask you? Uh, so they missed a couple of them. So, uh, <laughs> no, they didn't, but we can yeah. ask them about that when we what see the them heck? next month. What the heck's the deal with that? Anyway, they ask 100. And, and in May of 18, the 18 survey came out, and those 100 said there will be a slowdown beginning quarter one, 2020. They hit those same 100 authorities uh, last May, put it out, and it said it will begin quarter one, 2020, or 2020 again. So they didn't vary on that prediction. Uh, John Burns, uh, last week, at the Giants conference, uh, one of his guys, really good guy, Wayne, talked about that they see it coming in the next year uh, and that we're gonna end up down at around 850 to 950,000 units. It's not gonna be anything like the turn down 10 years ago, nothing whatsoever. We went down 80%, but there will be a slowdown and that will cause some, some winnowing out among the, the ranks. So what are we gonna do? I, I wrote a series of articles about preparing for the downturn uh, recently over the summer. And, uh, and by the time I got done with those articles, as a matter of fact, the third one just came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, I realized that everything I wrote uh, that was my ideas from my observations out there, uh, also a collection from 10 or 12 other builders. And the last one uh, featured a long, long time industry veteran, uh, Roger Casey. Uh, what his suggestions were, that all the things they're suggesting for the most part apply today too. So what we're really talking about is what can you do to improve your margins today specifically? And by the way, those are also going to help you prepare for the downturn. So that's a good thing. Uh, throughout here, I'll mention some columns and uh, we put these together sometimes in a series in a PDF booklet. And if you want any of those, we do it this way, make it simple. Just send uh, your email to info at truend.com or scott at truend.com. And uh, just say, uh, Alliance, send PDFs is all you gotta do. And then what we will do is send you the links to those plus some of our calculators like the save date calculator, the trip cost calculator. And then you can click on whatever uh, link you want and download just what you want those links tend to go through spam filters a lot better than uh, a bunch of uh, uh, attachments do. So uh, just remember to do that and, and Gene here will send that to you and you can pick and choose what you'd like. All right, so the brutal facts here. Uh, every day in this industry is a battle to control the chaos. Uh, you hear things like there's 40,000 pieces and parts in the house. Uh, I've heard 70,000, 80,000 pieces of parts, and we build them outdoors, and we'll have anywhere from 25, 30, up to 40, 45 supplier and trade contractor, contractors involved. That will vary by the type of house and whether you're turnkey and things or not. And typically anywhere, we've counted these a few times over the years, anywhere from 300 to as many as 500 different human beings will show up over a period of, oh, two or three months, if you're really good, maybe five, six, and there's some of you out there at eight or 10 months these days, to build that house uh, out in the elements. And it's incredible we do as well as we do. But this stuff uh, all contributes to complexity and nothing good ever comes out of complexity. The, the consequences of which always destroy profit, uh, not to mention you know morale, uh, attitudes, and the things that go along with it. This stuff never just gets better on its own. We've run now in the last 12 years, we've been around for 22 years as a company, but 12 years in the beginning of the downturn, we started doing our lean process implementations. Uh, and we've done uh, 220 plus of those now uh, with 160 builders in five countries, all sorts of type product. And we found 25 common failings. We have a list of 25 of these. Uh, and they all represent things that we've got to work on now. Uh, we can't tackle all 25 at once, you can't either. And I picked out 10 to talk about 
fairly briefly today uh, that are robbing your margins and forcing prices higher than the market will pay. Uh, so we did 10 that we're gonna go over pretty quickly. And if you send me the link, we'll send you the articles that have all 25 of them in there. Okay, so, oh, this, this thing's a little touchy. There you go, thanks, Betsy. Incomplete plans without detailed working drawings, including mechanicals. And I really mess people up when I add on including mechanicals, okay? And here's the issue. The great majority of the builders don't do detailed working drawing to the to the degree they should because they believe it costs too much to do that. And if you still believe that, it simply means you can't count very well. I don't mean to insult you, but you're counting not enough things and counting the wrong things. If you really know how to count all the, you look down below, the errors, emissions, the reworks, uh, all that add steps, time, and waste to your process, if you really count it right, you're going to find out that highly detailed working drawings, including mechanicals, will save you time and money. So without them, you get endless phone calls and questions or accept a just build by best guest approach. Uh, those don't work very well for you. So really focusing on those plans. We do something called lean plan workout. Uh, and let's see, okay. If I do that, does that cut my volume? I uh, better not chance it. Okay, I just heard a tone coming into the background. So I'll leave that on. Uh, so in this lean plan workout, where uh, a very structured process where we bring uh, 20 suppliers and trades in and they all get their 40 or 50 questions just for their area, you know, 40, 50 questions on plumbing, 40 or 50 on roofing, et cetera, et cetera. And they go through the plans and they mark them up with a, a coding system of markers and post-it notes and such. When they're done, they will typically end up with somewhere between 60 and 100 specific fixes and or improvement ideas per plan. Average about 80 of those. We've seen it go to 130, 140. You can imagine if you had your suppliers and trades sit down and very carefully figure out 80 things you need to fix on your plans, everybody will do better. You will do better, the builder, uh, the suppliers and trades will be more profitable and your customers will get a better house. So any, any skimping here is simply a waste. Second one we'll talk about here, let's see, number two, inadequacies, in, excuse me, inadequacies in standard plans, options, colors, and selections. And that doesn't mean more <laughs> options, uh, colors, and selections. So there's a, what I call a not so fine line here. Uh, on the one hand, you can give customers an unlimited choice to get whatever they want versus having them feel that they're getting what they want by providing the carefully chosen options and selections that they need. Okay, easier said than done, but it can be done. Uh, Paul Hornschmeyer, who worked for me for years, used to have this thing on his board of Scott's semi-famous sayings. And one of them goes like this. You can have as many options, selections, colors, uh, custom options, uh, uh, me mechanical changes, structural changes, you name it. You can have as many as you want if and only if you have the trained people, the systems, the processes, and the capable suppliers and trades to handle all that without brain damage. And I virtually never find that in uh, all the builders we go to everywhere. We have this real tendency to let our capacity uh, drag our capability. We get out in front of ourselves. So look at what your true capacity for that really is and ask both your own people down in the ranks and the suppliers and trades what kind of brain damage you're causing and set about to eliminate it. And usually it means doing both. It means improving your systems and processes, improving your training, communicating better with your trades, improving plans, and simplifying. So uh, choice B is infinitely simpler. Builders who handle the rampant complexity that goes with choice I, choice A are very hard to find. Number three, option selection is not 100% priced and agreed up front. 
this is another one that uh, it's interesting. Builders will often say, oh yeah, we've got that. But when we talk with their suppliers and trades, they'll say, well, no, they don't quite got that. Uh, and sometimes there's some real severe issues. One young guy I knew who went to, to be a number two purchasing guy in an operation out west. It was a very high bling builder uh, set out to try to straighten out the design center and discovered that 70% of their uh, options and pricing, the pricing of the option was wrong, 20% was just missing, and 10% they had right. It took them about six months to straighten all out. So we also have issues when those design centers that just have to reprice everything. It, and that again is a, is a prescription for complexity and waste or my favorite term from way back several decades ago in my Pulte years, uh, the favorite term was brain damage. So here's the rule that I strongly suggest, nothing ever appears in the model, the design center, or the nice pictures you have online until it's drawn, approved, priced, and agreed upon by the suppliers and trades. If that's the only thing you hey. do as a result. Was that a- Hey Scott, quick. Yeah. Quick question for you. Um, so you've talked about options and selections and you were talking about, you know, engaging the trades in the conversation to um, alter your plans and make sure things are going to be effective in the field. Um, since you've been doing this for a while, have you seen um, on your end any implications of people using BIM, both in the design and engineering process as part of kind of engaging their trades and, and in the option selection process? Um, can you talk about any, any impact you've seen with technology over the last couple of years? Wow, what a question. And that's another webinar, <laughs> a day long one with a whole bunch of people. Uh, yeah, I wrote a, a, a three article uh, series on BIM five or six years ago and I reread it recently to see how much has changed. Uh, yeah, things have changed. We're, we're getting better. We're going down it. on. A, on daily application and field, uh, and when we're working with the, the suppliers and trades in our lean weeks, we're not seeing a huge impact yet in terms of what percentage of what we're building out there. I and some other people can can make notes or say who are in this who are in the BIM business, so to speak, the providers, uh, and maybe it's more than this, but I don't think it's really affecting more than 10% of our production much yet. I mm -hmm. think it ought to be, we ought to be up to 70 or 80 or more, and we need to go there because, boy, it can help simplify things, sort things out, get things identified and fixed uh, before they get out to the field. Uh, and it, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge believer and supporter but a lot of people are having trouble making that transition. It's not easy for people. Uh, Todd Hallett, TK Design, that we share the offices with, there's 18 of them out there on the other side of the hallway, and they have been making that transition in the last year. Uh, okay. So I see people, yeah, we're, we're going that way, not as quickly as everybody expected or hoped, but I don't mean to say that to discourage anyone, uh, we need to do it and do it sooner than later. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I was just uh, asking you that because we've we've been working with some of the experts on the BIM side to develop a, a roadmap on that front as well to help people get case studies and, and see what's been adopted. I just wondered, since you're kind of in the trenches with builders, um, what you were seeing on your end. So that's interesting, thanks. You know, I'll just give an example. And, in walking houses, I've walked, I think, five builders' homes in the last three weeks, different parts of the country. Uh, and in most of them, we were able to talk about issues uh, that really address two things. I'm just picking one. We talked about tons of stuff, but one that jumped into my mind when you asked was, were the HVAC layouts, okay? Um, the vast majority of people are letting their local HVAC outfit do that design and specification. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're far from good, just doing what they've always done. Uh, and some of the things that Ibicus has demonstrated and some others about, you know, where to put the duct work, how to run the ducts. And we're seeing conflicts and collisions uh, when we're looking at that stuff. Uh, and we aren't experts on it. We just point out that 
things that are obvious that they need to be working on. Builders that are really starting to apply BIM can eliminate most of those problems ahead of time. So that's just one example uh, that could Yeah, help. and we have a, we got another question and I don't know, it's, it's related to BIM, so I think I started a trend here. Um, <laughs> and sure. if it's not appropriate for you, that's fine. We can get it answered from our, our experts on BIM offline as well. But um, has the problem with managing options in BIM been solved yet? Base plans with options on top of options. I don't oh, know if you have any thoughts solved. on that. Well, if it had been solved, they wouldn't be asking the question. But no, I mean, it's not been solved. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of tools out there. Uh, one of the big issues is the integration. And I know the software mm -hmm. providers out there, a lot of, they're really good people, they're building good stuff. Yet when I talk to the builders, builders continually moan about that the integration isn't there from their point of view yet. Now, okay. uh, the software companies will say it's because the builders aren't keeping the systems up and haven't trained enough people, will turn over people, and they've got some, some good points on that. The builders will say, well, the software companies don't have it solved yet and have maybe oversold some of that integration. Uh, I, I know everyone's working on this. I, I, I don't mean to be critical of everyone, anyone other than saying we need to keep working, keep pushing. Uh, mm -hmm. We've, there's a lot of solutions out there. And uh, I think it's, if you pick one of them, I mean, I could name off five or six of software companies. And I know companies that have it working really well, each one of them. And I know companies who have thrown up their hands and say, oh, this doesn't work. So what's the <laughs> variable there? Um, right. So we, it, well, well, we'll address that as well offline with, um, I mean, we've got Simpson Strong Tie and uh, My Tech and others who are part of the Alliance who can probably respond to that. Um, uh, offline. So we'll, we'll circle back with you folks who are on the phone on that front as well. Just wanted to get your initial thoughts, Scott. And, yeah, and um, I'm kind of caught between both worlds and it will, it'll be a good transition to going back into this where uh, I, I was, was a production guy uh, and stay very up to date on software and computer stuff. So I know what it can do and I, I know what the, the promise of this is uh, and, and what has to happen. But yet, I, we deal with builders and their issues every single day. There's not a, well, with a very few exceptions, I'll, I'll be conservative and say 95% of the builders in America have experienced a profit squeeze the last two years because their cost for everything from land to development to components to uh, materials to labor to overhead have all gone up faster than the market will let them raise their prices. And that's right. squeezing margins. And so they're interested in dealing with, okay, that, that stuff's all gonna be great. You know, I see the videos on LinkedIn and online, it's wonderful. What are we gonna do today? What do we do right now? And so right. what I'm giving you today are things that, uh, while we're waiting for deliverance, what do we have to do here? So mm -hmm. that'd be good theme music. Next time I do this, Betsy, we'll have to throw the theme song from the <laughs> All right. I don't know though. That that evokes too much imagery. I don't think that would be right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's go with number four, uh, incomplete house bid packages. And I can tell you, but in my training, I started when I was back in the uh, late 80s with a guy named Mike Rhodes in Chicago. Uh, for my money, one of the one of the list of three or four best VPs of construction. Uh, I've ever known in my life. Uh, there's one on here today. I won't say his name, but he's from Pennsylvania and I saw his name was on. Uh, I'm honored that he's on because he's so good. Uh, but guys that I grew up with, uh, the influence of Bill Pulte, uh, uh, Mike Rhodes in Chicago, Gary Grant in Minneapolis, these guys had the bid package, the contracting and the start package system absolutely nailed down like Gold. Bill Pulte used to call, and we got a slide for it, but it's just as well to start here, used to call the start package at Pulte the Bible. And then sometimes he'd say the bid package is the first book of the Bible and the construction Bible, and the, and the uh, start package is the second book 
of the construction Bible. Bill was a very religious man, so he didn't make that imagery lightly. Uh, but he wanted to get everyone's impression that these things have to be absolutely as good a gold that a supplier trade can count on. So in the bid package, from all these implementations we've had, it's actually we're up to more like we're over 5,000 suppliers and trades now. We hear this constantly, that these guys are being forced to bid without complete information, and they're forced to guess. And any one of you on today that was ever a supplier of trade could speak up right now and say, what do you do if you don't have complete information in a bid package? You don't have final plans. You don't have final specific specifications, or you know from working with this builder in the past that these plans are going to change once, twice, three times. Can you bid that builder as tight as you might like to? And the answer is absolutely not. So when builders are, are lamenting they aren't getting the bids they want, I challenge to go back and look at the bid package and what's in it. Uh, we can tell a lot about a builder when we go up in the field by looking at their bid packages. So the result of problems here comes down the line in uncontrolled variation, bogging down startup, putting the schedule in the hole from the start and all through, and lost margins. So related, kind of the next step is the incomplete base contracts with detailed scopes of work. And in those contracts, yeah, you have the base, but we need to get agreements in there for, for option selections too. Uh, it's rare that a builder can look you in the eyes and tell you they launch new product with 100% complete contracts and detailed scopes of work. Uh, I looked at the list earlier and I saw four or five people I know on that list who I know right now are, are smacking themselves up the side of the head. It's not that they don't want to do this, but uh, the, one of the biggest problems here is senior management that keeps changing product, changing what they're going to build, making adjustments. And this can go all the way back to the land you bought in the first place. If you didn't buy a piece of land that fits what you know how to build, that's predictable how to get entitled, you're going to end up with the purchasing team. Uh, and, uh, uh, somewhat, we're getting a huge uh, background of coughing and wheezing here. So someone's not feeling good, but they might move back from their, their <laughs> mic a little bit. Is that you, Betsy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not, but it is our it is our team. So if you're you know and you're in the other conference room, if you wouldn't mind muting your phone, that would be great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but that's so, a good little a good little break for a moment. I, I we did get a comment from someone who was saying um, in this area it's hell for them when it comes to the HVAC design. So that yeah, was just a, say that again. A, a kind of a uh, someone who's who's on the line today said in terms of not getting the detailed scopes of work, it's hell for them with the HVAC design. So that was a comment rather than a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, on the line. Ibicus has done a lot in this area. And there are some consultants out there that do a really good job in this area. Uh, but it means getting, getting, having the knowledge and, and sitting down with, to get the HVAC guys involved ahead before you, you're out there, you know, building, or at least, I was in a session where I had 30 builders week before last, and I asked how many of them always, and they'd have to prove it to me by giving me 10 of their key suppliers and trades, and letting me call them right now, and they would answer yes. The question is how many of them always stop a new model at the framed with mechanical stage prior to drywall, prior to insulation, and bring at a minimum your foundation frame and your mechanicals out and thoroughly walk that house. Out of 30, only two rose their hands. One was an ex Pulte guy from 30 years ago that I worked with. And another one was a client of ours that we beat people over the head about this. It, every single time you do it, you will save money. You can get it done in two hours. There's simply no excuse for not doing it. And it gets harder with the mechanicals, yeah, but you have to do it. Otherwise, you pay the price for not doing it, and you're, and you're paying the price now. So and for those uh, of you who are, oh, again? Scott, one thing um, along this front, for those of you who are, who are going to be able to make it out to Denver with us next month, we actually do have Simpson Strong Tie and Anthony Grizzolia from Ibicus are going to take a design 
and look at it from an integrated design and engineering systems thinking perspective with BIM and do some of the things, you know, do some of that detailed work on the HVAC front um, and, uh, you know, and the wall systems, et cetera. So um, kind of showing what can be done and how to think differently about it. Um, and we'll, we'll pull some of the details. If you're not able to make it, we'll share some of the highlights from that um, through our newsletter as well. Uh, but hopefully you can make it out with us next month on that front. Uh, and then the second point on this, I'll finish up this one with, is that well done contracts with explicit two-way scope simplify everything, presuming they're communicated and followed. Now, here's one little hint I can give you. Your scopes of work, the very first page of all of them should only say one thing, what it is that you, the builder, are committed to doing for that supplier or trade. That's what the first page should say, because what's the whole rest of, the, of a scope says? It says everything that they have to do for you or you're going to shoot them. Okay, now we have to lay those things out. They're important. You know, the, the broom clean home and the and the, uh, what the tolerances all are for concrete or walls or uh, uh, airflow. That's critically important. But try the first page, what you gonna do for them, what they can expect to get from you. It changes the tone of everything. And make sure they're two way. Every year you should sit down with your, whoever your best trade is in each category and say, uh, send them the scope ahead of time with a red pen. By the way, it's very powerful if you actually send them the red pen. Might sound silly, but you'll get a lot more back. And go out, have lunch, sit down and say, how can we make this better? And they will give you things. And it doesn't take very long. All right, let's do number six. So now we're on to the house start packages. Okay, this is a sequence, a bid package and contracts, house start packages. And the, the benefit that suppliers and trades, but also for the benefit of your field supervisors. Uh, to have that, that start package, what Bill Pulte called the Bible, out in the field. If you don't have a good bid package, you're not going to have a good start package. You will have inadequacies guaranteed. You can catch up to some degree, uh, but you'll never catch it completely. Anything that's open to definition uh, that isn't clear, will cause mistakes, rework, extra trips, schedule delays. Uh, so anything you can push upstream will save you downstream, okay? Uh, this note from my October column about complexity, uh, actually that was a year ago, October. Again, uh, we'll send you links to all that. Just hit info at truend.com and just put Alliance links in the subject line. That's all you gotta do. Uh, if you wanna, you know, say you really enjoyed this and uh, you too agree I need a new picture, that's okay. Everybody keeps telling me that. I'll get it next. All right, number seven, high turnover in suppliers and trades. Again, this is another day long workshop uh, and that would just be getting started. But the turnover in your suppliers and trades is so much more expensive and very, very few people know how to measure it. I'm not talking about the the kind of relationships that we run into sometimes like an old married couple that's grown apart and they're still working together, but they're not communicating at all. These are continually worked, challenged, uh, ratified relationships supported between suppliers and trades and the builder. Uh, those of you who have those know what a difference it makes. It simplifies everything. One of the best builders I know in America last week in a group uh, happened to mention in front of a lot of people that they are at 100% sole source. And I could see the look on a lot of the purchasing and construction folks' faces. They're like, that guy's nuts. I'll tell you what, I would bet uh, uh, dollars to donuts or dimes to dollars that this particular guy has a greater profit than anybody, any of the builders that were giving him those looks. Okay, that is not easy to do. It took that builder 10 years to identify and get the right suppliers and trades on board and develop those relationships. And they work on them continually. Another thing to remember here, the second bullet 
point is that we still spend so much of our time focusing on bid price alone. Everybody understands this intellectually. I've been writing about this issue for all 22 and a half years. I've had my monthly column. Uh, but total cost is the only thing that matters. If you're still buying on bid price alone, the only thing that guarantees you is that you are never, except for just dumb luck, operating by lowest total cost. Uh, that's an, another webinar, but when we teach it, we show 10 factors that you need to consider in total cost. And again, if you're doing it right, it won't cost you any more time. It will save you time and profit, okay? Long-term what, what are some of those? Yeah. Oh, hold on, what are some of those factors in total cost? Oh, and the group, they all know them. You've got quality, you've got delivery, you've got participates, in your planning and your, your plan improvement and your development efforts, uh, advises you continually on the right and the wrong products to be using, works and plays well with others. Uh, <laughs> and that, that, you know, that's a really important thing. You've got to get along with the guys right. ahead of you, behind you, uh, takes, sure, you know, so, and your superintendents out there, they know most of that, what's going on. Uh, there's one guy who I know is on right now. I saw his name earlier. And I remember talking to him once years ago about he was running a project and they switched painters on him because the purchasing guys got a better deal and proceeded to make his life totally miserable for the rest of the year. And they thought they were saving <laughs> money. They were not. So again, that, we'll include that in the uh, articles and you'll see the total cost stuff. But sum up that one. Uh, Long-term relationships with the right suppliers and trades always simplifies the process. It's in this business, anything you can do to simplify is a benefit. This one I had to put in because we see this a lot. People spend a whole lot of money on these beautiful sales and design centers. I mean, I like walking through them too. And I would never tell anyone, oh, don't have one. Oh, there are builders who function perfectly well without them, uh, but they can be really beneficial. Here's what we find out. A lot of times when builders start analyzing what's being sold in their sales and design centers that they think they're making money on, when they take a total cost perspective and you got to have associated overhead added into there, they're not making money on them at all, often losing money. So the translating of a contract through design, whether you do it out in the models or you're heaven forbid, still sending them to the, elect, the fixture store in the carpet store. There are people who still do that. Uh, or have your design center, but translating it from the customer's wishes into the start packages. Getting what I call sales fulfillment, the details 100% of the time, okay? So again, anything missed is a chain of complexity all down the line. Uh, one of the first columns I wrote 22 years ago was called Ted Story. And it was about a young superintendent out in the field. He was in Mundelein, Illinois, and I went to talk to him. And he was pulling his hair out on a late Friday afternoon because they had walked a house and found out that a garage service door the customer ordered was missing. And that house was going to close Monday. And the pr president complained, we will cl close no house unless it's 100% ready. And he ended up working all day Saturday, missing his son's little league game, the whole deal, because something got dropped due to the complexity in their selections. So there's all sorts of variation that gets injected into the system, this, which then leads us to a favorite area of mine. I have a series of columns called VPO Nightmare. I set out to write one on that. Those were about a year and a half ago. It ended up being four and I wasn't done. And finally, Denise, my editor said, okay, you got to stop for a while. Uh, but variance is a nightmare in this country. It's eating margin alive. And I have yet to find a single builder in America, and I've been looking, who measures it completely and correctly. To learn about that, you got to read those columns, but I'll give you the hint. What everyone's mission, you know, you look at your variant, your VPOs, whether you call them EPOs, FBOs, or just an additional an invoice, anything that comes through after that house starts that, and, and you know, everything should have been chosen and selected before that house starts. And he comes after that start, 
it's a variance. Even if it was a late selection, it still impacts as a variance, it impacts your suppliers and trades. They don't make money on those, it drives them nuts. Even if they get you to pay for them, they don't make money on them. It drives your supervisors nuts all the way down to the warranty out in the field. So you've got to track how many VPOs per unit you're doing and then the dollar value, because that can fool you. And you look at your variances and they all will say labor and or materials. Sometimes you might get a trip cost on there, you're willing to pay them, but you'll find that no more than five or 10% of it over a year is overhead associated with that variance and not just the builder, but the supplier and the trade. Start counting the overhead and you're gonna find out that's the biggest single factor in your variance. You focus on that next year, I guarantee you, you will make more money, your customers will have a better house and your suppliers and trades will start to make you the builder of choice. So number 10, schedule. You know, another long theme, been working on this one for 30 years. A schedule with no predictability, at least some weeks in advance, is not a schedule, that's a notion. And we see so many people now who are just the schedules constantly changing. Yeah, they've got a schedule out there and it's in the computer on paper, but it's constantly moving and changing. Uh, for every builder associate you have, never forget, uh, that means every employee in your company, there are 20 to 25 supplier and trade employees, it's a ratio we actually counted way back, that have to respond to all these changes. Scheduling by the day, which we see so many people doing in effect now, means continual change, variation, complexity. You know, as I say, just send them a burn notice because that's what it's gonna do into your and their bottom line. Here we got Gary Grant, Mike Rhodes again here, and I'm not making this up, and this was 30 years ago. They got cranky anytime their schedule wasn't gold less than 60 days out. At that time, uh, Rhodes was doing 800 to 1,000 units, and Gary Grant was doing 600, 650 units and their schedules were absolutely good as gold for those suppliers and trade 60 days ahead of time. And they worked on it. It wasn't working every day. It was every hour of every day to make sure it stayed right. And stop and think about it. If your trades could, could say all right now and your suppliers that your schedule was good as gold just 15 days out, how much simpler their life would be uh, and how much better things would be. So I say, just get the damn de de dependable 10 days in advance this year for starters, and everything will get better. So, summing up here, these fails, all they do is result in profit belief. Consequences is complexity and uncontrolled complexity. We get more turno turnover, internal and external. Uh, you can believe the number of lean processes we have had pushed back this year. Uh, because of key people leaving and, and going to other builders. Uh, it's been rampant in the last two years. Barriers to becoming the builder of choice and supplier choice. Compromise quality, unhappy cost, customers, lost profit. If that's all okay, you know, do the old uh, Einstein, just keep uh, doing the same things you've always done them and expecting results. It takes continual <laughs> vigilance and a lot of guts to blow the whistle whenever complexity exceeds process and systems capacity. You gotta take care of the sins of the past while you're acting proactively to kill it for the future. That's not easy, but the payback will be quick and massive. So to sum it up, while we await deliverance through the advanced offsite technologies, again, <laughs> I'm a big supporter of, you gotta master the short game by focusing on these key big sources of profit loss, reducing variance, reducing cycle time, simplifying every process, and becoming the builder of choice. All right, All right. that's the story. So, <laughs> so you've talked a bit about, you know, we're waiting for deliverance. What would you say to builders if they are looking to go uh, partner with someone for offsite construction? What would you say are the first couple of things they should do internally from a process perspective to prepare themselves to go that route? Well, one of the things Dr. Deming always said was you, you simplify a process, standardize it, then improve it. 
to the degree you do that, everything will get better. Those of you who have done major software, software implementations can probably all attest to the, the brain damage that occurs when you don't do that. Because you get this, you look at this new process, it's gonna fix all that stuff. Anything you can do in simplification standardization first will make improvement much easier. One of the things I highly recommend, again, we'll, we'll send this, and these all be labeled, you can see what they are. As Betsy, you know, I wrote a series of three uh, a year ago last summer on uh, <laughs> the offsite technologies coming and basically saying right. the problem people have is they don't know how to measure the true total cost of both their current processes and the offsite solutions. People are only a measure or portion of each. I can't tell you how many times, for example, we've talked to people who are doing, not using trusses or stick building rust. And by the way, on this side, I'm gonna say, there are some locations where that, that trusses have still not been able to beat uh, stick belt rust on cost. It seems insane, but there are a few people who have measured right. Most people though, do not measure all the factors involved. And when they do, all of a sudden the equation changes. One of the ones that we see over and over again is people not removing the thickened footers in their base, in their slabs or their basements or the transferring the loads down because when you go to trusses, you push the loads to the outer wall substantially, sometimes substantially. And the whole inside structure changes. We've not seen people take out the full value of the material and the labor from doing that. So my big caution here is learn how to measure it. We are working and Ibicus, we're trying to work together on it. We got to get back to that, Betsy. Uh, yes, we do. And, and, you guys, <laughs> and housing innovation, uh, working on uh, a, a template, an Excel template. We've got a great yep. outline for it and a lot of things we're working together and we hoped to have that for you soon, and we'll make sure yeah. we save these requests and get it out to you. Absolutely. Um, and related to that, so one thing came to mind, and I and then I have another question um, related to getting your processes in order. We had some really good reviews. We did a webinar earlier this year on process mapping, and we shared some tools um, on that front uh, with folks who attended that webinar as well. Um, we can also make those available to you guys who are on the phone, but um, really good systematic way to kind of document what you're trying, what you're doing now, uh, what you need to do to evolve your processes, and um, kind of create a hierarchy of the plan to tackle it as well. So I think those two things, you know, with what you just said, kind of go hand in hand. Let me and then I have a add, very Betsy. Let me add on something. Oh yeah. Quick. If if what we found is every time. We do process mapping. You know, you guys do it. Fletcher Groves do it. A lot of people can do it for you. Uh, if you don't really know how to do it, don't do it on your own. You can find someone to help you do it. Mm -hmm. If any time people go through a process mapping, they realize and they will tell you there's a whole lot about their process they never understood, even as much as saying they flat out never understood their process. Now, everybody believes they do, but you, in order to prove something, you've got to understand it. So you really need to do that process mapping so you fully understand what's going on. Yep. So I, we have someone say that if you can't get to 0% variance, because we know that's a, a pipe dream, <laughs> what would you say is an acceptable percentage from a variance perspective? I don't know. That's like saying, what's the acceptable percentage of beating your children? Um, I, mean, it's oh, a, I think that's it's a little pushed. You know, I'm telling you, <laughs> hey, I'm I'm sold now that I can just say what I think. It's I understand <laughs> what you're saying. It's none of it. What what excess preventable waste could ever be acceptable? I mean, uh, one of our guys just uh, of the True North team just had triple bypass yesterday. You know, <laughs> well, how much variance should we accept in open heart surgery? Um, I. I you just have to say no. None of it's, none of nothing's acceptable. Yeah, stuff will happen. Someone will, will run over a, a a two by ten on a curb. Well, okay. Every single one that happens, 
you, you don't go out and shoot somebody. You say, what could we have done uh, to prevent it? Right. And you find there, there's always something you do to prevent it. So just don't accept any of it. Uh, I'll just say this. The, the, the best companies will have less than a half a percent counting the way you all count it right now. But the, none wow. of you are counting it right. <laughs> <laughs> but that I'm sure is another webinar for another time. There you go. <laughs> well, um, thanks, Scott. Uh, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, and I know uh, Natalie has some uh, some uh, kind of closing uh, remarks for you. So thank you so much, Scott, for um, for sharing your insights with us today. Um, as he mentioned, we will. Um, you can send him an email, and we'll make those notes for you in the follow-up email that we send you from today's call as well, um, just with his email address in there and a reminder of how to get other resources from him, um, as, well, as well as other resources that we'll share with you. Um, but I'm going to turn the floor over to Natalie for just one or two minutes, if you can hang in. Um, we'll give you some closing info, and thanks for everybody who participated today. Take it away, Natalie. We hope you can join us next Thursday. It's our, we'll have our next free webinar in this series focused on attainability. Betsy, do you just want to give them a quick snapshot on what we'll hear from Tom? Um, so Tom is with Kitson and Partners, and it's, um, they have a huge community called Babcock Ranch, and they recently did a, um, a bit of a uh, roundtable of their own with about 27 experts looking at how they can drive innovation in the long term within their business. And attainability was a key part of that. So they're going to share what they learned, why they're doing, uh, why, why they're tackling attainability, and, and why they had that um, that session, um, and how it's changed the way that they're thinking about what they're doing in their community moving forward. So we're um, glad to have him participate with us next week. And our next in-person event will be in Denver on November 12th and 13th. And I'll send you a link in the follow-up email this afternoon. So make sure you take a look because our room block closes this Friday and registration ends on November 1st. And then lastly, so ultimately we believe it's time for new thinking, new collaborative relationships, and new solutions in housing. And we have a lot of new friends on logged in today, and we invite you to join our community to help shape the future of housing. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Scott. And uh, we'll also drop these uh, a link to the PDF of these slides to you in our follow-up email. And have a great rest of your day.